There was a time in the 1990s when it seemed like ska music was everywhere. On the radio, in movies, on TV, even on top of the billboard charts. Exciting. These are the stories you dream about. Like that time, it felt like this was right. And it felt like if I could define a music for the mid 90s, it was ska punk. This is so different and so weird, and my parents are gonna hate it. I love it. No one's gonna get it. And I get to go back to high school, and the preppy girls are gonna be like, oh, where did you go this weekend? I'll be like, yeah, you, you're not even gonna understand. Like, ska. Yeah, ska is ours. It's for the weird kids, you know? <laughs> Before that, it was you know, two tone, very, you know, black and white specials. Everything was just chicka, chicka, chicka. And somehow the color exploded from the No Doubt and Real Big Fish and Less Than Jake and Goldfinger, you know, and that was that positive. Here we go. Now you're starting to see on a national level a band like the Boston's come in and this is this is bigger than our little thing. This is something next level. Back then it was like the people that liked the music loved the music. I just tell people like it's the perfect dance music, you know, and in their mind they're probably thinking like maybe hip hop or something, but I think a lot of people just look at especially the ska music of the late nineties. It's kind of wacky, silly. Think, oh, don't take it seriously, it's just a joke, but it means a lot to us. As a teenager, it was just like, wow, there's a music out there where it just makes me feel positive, it makes me feel good, and when the right band does it, you feel it. You know, like if I, I like literally somebody walking down the street that's like, why do I want to come see your show? Right. And I'm like, oh, you like it. I'm like, I guarantee, come in, I, I like 90% chance you'll like it. It made me really happy. I mean, to watch the way that a bunch of young musicians in America decided that they would love and use this really powerful dance music with an incredible groove that they had was amazing for me. It's kind of hard to deny ska in a, in a lot of ways. Like, there's an infectiousness to it where if you're not open to it, maybe you're not going to get there. But if you're at all susceptible, it's going to get you. It's just fun music, man. It's like you dance to it, you feel like you can let go of all the shit that happens in real life. It's a very infectious sound and very fun, positive music that that is lovable. I, you know, I think every generation has their, like, oh, we were hippies, man, we were at Woodstock, that was the greatest time, and I'm sure it was awesome, but I was lucky enough to be in a dumb, dopey ska band, and playing with some amazing other bands and get to see the world, get to make friends all over the place. And I think just right place, right time a lot too, where just the world was ready for fun music. And I think ska, especially in Orange County, Southern California and the United States, just it blew up at that time. I mean, the idea of us being a ska band was kind of ridiculous. I mean, let's just call it like it is. We're just a bunch of dumb white guys from Southern California, you know, like, we probably have no business playing ska. The way SoCal blended all the punk that was already SoCal punk with yeah. like the the modern ska was really just unique and powerful at the time, honestly. Yeah. Even if it got laughed at afterwards, you know. Ska defines who I am as a person, and I will never turn my back on ska. Huh. Looking back, I have no regrets. You should. Yep. It was a, a very short window of passing time, and then by Late 99, 2000, it was over. Bands were getting dropped. A lot of people thought maybe we were a joke or something because uh, we were a third wave ska band. Blame us, why don't you? Just come out and say it. It's Orange County's fault that ska crashed. Yes, yes, we overdid it. Are you happy now?
It became different because in, say, 87, you'd be hard-pressed to find people who knew what ska music was. But seven, eight years later, you'd be hard-pressed to find a young person who'd never heard of it. Hi, I'm Scott, and we're here in Times Square in New York City, and we're going to talk to people about ska music. See how that goes. Ska, ska, ska music. Familiar with the, know how to, ska music. You know about ska music, sir? Ska music, ma'am? No? We're asking people on the street in New York if they know anything about ska music. Not at all. Are you familiar with ska music? What kind of Ska music? No. Ska music? Do you know anything about ska music? Ska music? Never heard of it. Are you familiar with ska music? No. There's no pressure. This is not a test. There's no money involved. But do you know, like, um, you have, like, uh, Sublime? No, no, I'm too young for that. <laughs> no, no, no. Not, that was like 90s. I was born in the 90s. <laughs> Unfamiliar territory. Completely. No. What is ska music? Uh, have you ever heard of the specials? No, what are the specials? And they're a band. Uh, the specials? I've heard of them. They're an old English band, aren't they? What do you know about ska music? Do you know about ska music? Come here, talk to me, for goodness sakes. I hate saying no doubt because they're not really ska, but they have, like, the elements. Uh, how about uh, no doubt? I have heard of no doubt. When Stefani, right? <laughs> okay, great. How familiar are you with ska music? Ska? Not at all. How familiar are you with the ska music? Very familiar with the ska music. It was the precursor to the reggae music and the British beat and, and all those great bands that came out. The Scottalites made you move, man. Even if you didn't want to move, it made you move. This is so great. I just learned something today. You learn something new every day. Hey. <laughs> so where did ska music come from? Ska begins in Kingston, Jamaica at the end of the 1950s. The homegrown music of the island, Mento, blended with the jazz music performed for tourists and nightclubs, and the rhythm and blues picked up on transistors from American radio stations. It was a strange recipe of lively horns and drums, and sometimes a piano, and maybe even some vocals. But it was that distinctive syncopated rhythm that really made Sky its own creation. It was different. It was fun. It was a source of upbeat, up-tempo joy, no matter what the political, social, or economic situation of those who wore their best shoes and danced. And danced to it, they did. In places like Forcers Hall and Kokomo Lawn and Tao Jubilee Gardens. These were the original dance halls. Some had walls, some were outdoors and yards with nothing but a zinc fence surrounding the space inside where Kingston DJs, called sound system operators, held dances every night of the week. Imagine paying a few bucks or shillings since Jamaica was still a colony of Britain back then, walking inside a sound system dance on a Saturday night, bass pumping, horns blaring from massive handmade speaker boxes stacked high in the hot night sky. Speakers strapped to tree branches so every man, woman, and child from miles around could hear the records on the turntables. The sound wafting, mixing with the smoke of curry goat and fried red snapper. Scott was more than music. Scott was an experience. Dances attracted hundreds of people who dressed sharp to move to the music of local artists like Laurel Atkins, Derek Morgan, Prince Buster, Desmond Decker, and even young Jimmy Cliff and Bob Marley. To supply the music, sound system operators also recorded these new Jamaican artists, auditioning vocalists in their studios every day of the week. Behind the singers were the house bands, hornsmen, as they were called. They were highly skilled musicians, trained in jazz and classical music. They came to the recording studios to try to earn a living, a few coins for a recording that the sound system operators then used to play that night. Sometimes to battle one another for the biggest crowd in what was known as a clash. Competition was tough. It was a big business. There were fights between groups that aligned themselves with the sound systems. These were the rude boys. They dressed to the nines, wore sunglasses at night, and exhibited their power by breaking needles from the rival turntable and pushing around the audience to 
break up the party. So how did this music, dance, and culture even make its way to America? It wasn't a direct route. It was through the migration of Jamaican people to England that ska travels, like a bird with a seed, where it's planted in places like Brixton, Notting Hill, Coventry. They came in search of work and brought their records and musical taste with them. So at house parties and dance clubs, Jamaican immigrants felt like they were home. The white working class youth who lived and worked alongside the Jamaicans loved what they heard. They loved My Boy Lollipop by Millie Small. They loved Desmond Decker's 007 Shantytown and Prince Buster's One Step Beyond. They also loved their style, dress, and attitude, sharp and cool like the Rude Boys. And when the white youth brought their own musical backgrounds and taste into the mix, punk and soul, another recipe for Sky was born, Two-Tone. Two-Tone became wildly popular in England as early as 1979 and lasted until 1984. Named after the record label founded by Jerry Dammers of the Specials, this ska movement sounded very different from its Jamaican parents. It wasn't just fast, it was frenetic. Bands like The Specials, The Selector, The Beat, Madness, and Bad Manners topped the charts with songs that spoke of politics and racial unity. Members of these groups were both black and white. The songs were either brand new creations or covers of the original Jamaican songs. But the sound always featured that distinctive ska rhythm. It was through this British version that ska began to take foothold in America. Well, just think about how before you'd have to explain to somebody what ska was. What is ska? What is ska, Sasha? <laughs> what are you under a rock, man? You don't know what ska music is? Gee. I don't know what ska music is. People say, what is ska? What do you play? I guess if my mom asked me what ska music is, I would say it's, it's a danceable, upbeat, major key, fun party music. I say it's, it's fun, it's got horns in it, you can dance to it. What I want to tell them is about the tribe, <laughs> you know, and like how important it's been in my life. Like if I have longer, I'll explain that like, like, oh no, I found people with like this common music interest all over the world, but the short answer is fast reggae. Ska, the way I explain Ska is like an upbeat version of reggae. It's basically just fast reggae. Uh, I usually just say it's fast reggae. I was gonna say it's fast reggae, but if yeah. you didn't know what reggae is, then that wouldn't work. The description was, it's faster reggae with horns, which is terrible. In reality, Ska is the grandfather to reggae music. Before reggae, there was ska. Which slowed down into rock steady a couple of years later, which turned into reggae, which has spawned the world. So without, without ska, there would be no reggae. Everybody's heard ska before, but they, you don't know how to like put it into words, or you try and describe bands that play ska or played ska, and then people will say, I've never heard of them, never heard of them. Even when you go all the way to the top echelon, which is like no doubt, you say like, oh, no doubt. And they go like, oh yeah, I've heard of no doubt. And you go, well, do you have you heard any of like the really early stuff? Yeah, and they're not, like, no, not really. Not like feeling hell good. No, but picture that with horns. And if that doesn't resonate, you just go, picture happy music. And then with horns, and they go, oh, like Chicago. And then if you're trying to get out of the conversation, you go, yeah, sure. just like Chicago. Yeah, yeah. We're exactly like Chicago. To me, that like ska music is such a beautiful thing because of where it came from. I mean, it's the ultimate story of just underdogs prevailing and like creating beauty out of like n like nothing. It's Jamaican people taking American big band rock and roll and, and making their own version of it. You know, I'm, I'm sure when they had a few joints and some rum, I'd made this thing that they called ska music because they had to come up with some, because it wasn't jazz, it wasn't big band, it wasn't rock and roll, it was therapy, so they called it ska. And then you get the musicality of it as well, you know, I mean, the guys in the Scatolites were all jazz guys to begin with. Their heroes were people like Lester Young and John Coltrane and Charlie Parker and people like this. They idolized these guys. You know, as soon as you hear that opening timbali or that opening snare run and all of a sudden this bass starts rolling, the keys start bubbling. Everything is on the second beat and the fourth beat as an upbeat which has this very fun, danceable energy to it that's pretty infectious. You know, we all had these little worlds of music that we were exploring. So when we'd get in a van together or rehearse, 
these would all clash. You have this circle which represents uh, reggae, you have this circle that represents punk, this circle that represents rock and roll, and this circle that represents jazz. And when you push them together, at the point of intersection, the nexus of intersection of all those styles, is where ska music sits. Because ska music is not only drawn from these sources, it's given back to it. So it's a mixture of all those things. I mean, I remember hearing the first English Beat for Specials record when I was 16 and just going, what the fuck, what is this? I love this shit, it's fucking great. Listening to Madness and the Specials and Selector and hearing bands like that as a kid, not really knowing that that was ska. The Specials and Hindsight are the greatest ska band of all time. That record, if you don't like it, then there's something wrong with you. Stop your messing around. So we started off with all these, these uh, wonderful ideas about changing the world like most generations do, you know. And we just ended up getting fucked up. <laughs> but we've made a lot of people happy while we were doing it, you know. Check, check, check. And this is uh, Tuesday, uh, the 8th of uh, March, check, check, check. 1988. Operation Ivy only put out one album, one album, you know, and they're more popular now than they were when they were a band. I mean, that, that album, Energy, is, I mean, that's a classic. It's one of those things like, you don't know Op Ivy, like, get on that if you're going to be into ska music. And you're like, oh, okay. And then you pretend like you've always known. No, it's just like, what in the fuck is this? I don't understand how they're even playing this stuff, but I'm going to figure it out, you know? I would get into my car for high school, and it would be early in the morning and really cold, and I had dubbed the LP to a cassette. I just would have a lot of moaning in my head, just like, life's hard, why do I have to go to school? And then I'd put up in the Operation Ivy record, and immediately I'd be in a good mood, and it would just fill me up with just just energy, energy if you will, and I'd be like ready, and my, my thoughts would be more positive, and it's just, I remember thinking that was such a great gift that this band had done for me, and I appreciated it so much that I was in my car, and I, I remember uh, saying, I'm gonna do this for other people. I mean, look, ska punk, it just, it, it didn't exist before Operation Ivy, you know? And then Operation Ivy kind of pushed into the early 90s and became what we're talking about now. Then from there, it was just, that was like the gateway. Then it was like, you know, Boss Tones, uh, Fishbone. Without Fishbone, I, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now. I'd go to Fishbone and then, you know, it'd be on a school night. And I wouldn't be able to sleep after the show because I'd be so wired, you know, a natural high of just, wow, what I just saw was amazing. They were so influential, and not only musically, but just as minorities, just seeing people of color playing a rock and roll based music, insane. We were super into Fishbone, and we tried to play funk, and it was bad. Like, our bass player couldn't do the thumb thing. He, we could play arpeggios really fast, so I'm like, okay, we sound cool playing ska, let's do that. That's how new music happens. You're trying to, like, emulate your heroes a bit, but you're probably not that good at music at the time. And it comes out as something completely different, and that's new music, you know? What is skanky? <laughs> Skanking is so mechanically easy that it gave every awkward kid the opportunity to dance. Skanking, man, you know, you doing that. It's a lot of jumping going on. I think the challenge that I always had with the word skanking is just it's got, it's got skank in it. <laughs> The skank is, is a primal move, you know? <laughs> it really is. It's just a way of being, a way of moving that is just raw. It's hard not to move when you hear a good ska song. It's hard not to at least bounce your head or tap your foot or just, you know, get into it a little bit. There's always one guy that is like this during the ska song, like he'll roll his eyes, but then halfway through the song, he's like, 
And then towards the end of the song, he's like. And then, and then he'll look around like, did anybody see me? St. Louis, we were on tour with the Dance Hall Crashers and we played this show and again, nobody moved. Like, boo, where's the Dance Hall Crashers? The next day we had an interview and the guy said, so tell me, how do you feel about the Midwest in general? And I said, man, F the Midwest. <laughs> we come all the way out here to play music and nobody dances. Everybody's just standing around looking at us. And the guy's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, cut the tape. <laughs> Roll it back. And he's like, listen, the reason why nobody dances to your music is because they don't know how to. And for me, it was like a, oh, I'm sorry, moment. And it was from that point that Alex and I began doing kind of synchronized dances to kind of give the crowd an idea of, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this. And it worked. Before, you come in and everyone would dance in the line, together. And that, that's it in the audience. Everyone is lined up and there's no marching. Then it was marching. Boom, 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 boom. Everyone it was just chaos. And the scar got faster too. Yeah, you had more, you had more like the specials type vibes. And then it just went into more like the poor stones. Everything was the poor stones. <laughs> Heavy. If you want to talk about third wave ska, that's the band. Like they were the ones who really said, this is what it means to be a ska band in this era. Think of the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones. How many members? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight members. And then like Ben Carb. Bless him. But what did Ben Carr do? All he did was dance, and it's the same dance for the entire show. He's like, the, he's the best at what he does. Nobody does it better than Ben. When we were a young band, we couldn't get into the club unless you were in the band, because most of us were under the drinking age. So Ben was just a, like a guy that was hanging around with us. When we walked in the back of the rat, we just basically said, yeah, he's in the band, you know, and he got up on stage and was in the band, and he really ran with it, <laughs> so to speak. Picture some guy with, big music business guy with a cigar being like, you gotta lose, the, we don't need him, you know? Stories like that where a band is still brothers, and they still take care of each other, and they get it, and they, they're not looking to the horizon for something else. They realize what's in front of them, what's working, and what's good. And the fact that I, I heard that, you know, he's an equal member is just it's what it's made of. Going to ska shows was a unique experience. And audiences, just like in the UK, just like in Jamaica, often dressed up for the shows. It was all about dancing, supporting the bands, and having one big party at Ground Zero. You would go to shows and you're like, oh, what's everybody wearing? As you can see, <laughs> I like dressing up, man. I love my pork pie hats and my, my Doc Martens suit and tie, polo shirts, with the little collars. The skinny tie with a little, you know, punk rock button. And then you had the variations of, you know, were you a rude boy or were you a mod? The mod movement with the Vespas and the Lambrettas and the Ben Sherman and the Fred Perry and all of it, you know, like it just, that image will always be in my brain is like, that's what cool people look like. Like when you went to see a ska band, they, they, they cared that they were playing a show, they dressed up for it. Fashion in the boss tones. Don't get me started. <laughs> the, the whole like plaid thing and all that, that just kind of grew out of us trying to like have fun and be entertaining. Back then it was like, we're playing clubs where it's literally 110 degrees in the club and I've got a full three piece suit all buttoned up the whole show. Even to this day, like my wife will be like, dude, take off your fucking tie like halfway through the set because I'm drenched because of sweat. And it's just like, and that's the other dilemma is like I would sweat so much in these suits that they'd shrink because they're not supposed to be washed, and then the next show they'd be like up to here, and I'd be like. <laughs> we were the kind of dudes that uh, whatever we were wearing that day, you know, on tour, like you get out of the van and that's what you're wearing on stage probably that night, you know. The older crowd that, you know, that came up in the 80s would kind of look at these kids going, you know, you need to tuck your shirt in. There were these unwritten rules where you had to look a certain way. You had to wear your hair a certain way. 
We would go thrift shopping and look for vintage suits. It wasn't like, oh, let's just wear a random suit and a skinny tie. We had to have everything perfect. Instead of skinny ties, we started wearing like fat ties and like buying like cheap polyester suits at thrift stores because that was kind of what was available. You'd have these kids at ska shows, they were raiding their father's closets and basically putting on their dad's ties and their dad's suits and like some hat that they would find in the garage or something. There's always going to be the guy in the Hawaiian shirt. It had a little bit to do with the Hawaiian shirt being associated with ska. I'm sorry, or you're welcome. You can go to a ska show, dress however you want, and you're accepted. And so that kind of became the whole wacky thing about ska. You know, you wear the checkers and you wear the, the, the crazy colors and the outfits and stuff, and it, it, it all fit. It didn't match and it fit. We're still going? Go! We just said, hey, let's get a bunch of our friends together and start a ska band kind of as a joke. Our friend Boyd, who worked at a wetsuit company, he's like, I got an idea. Let's be like Devo, we'll all wear the same thing and just be like a silly ska band, you know? And <laughs> that's the beginning of the Aquabats. It was a trip, and, and the Aquabats was so such a different style. It was more new wave and experimental. So many different styles. We, we would play a punk rock song, we would write a Latin song, we would write a super new wave song, we would write a surf song, it was just, a anything goes. So Travis, he shows up, he comes backstage and I give him his costume, he's like, what's this? I'm like, that's your costume, you wear a costume. Like on the record, like we're wearing costumes. And he was like, really? I didn't know that. <laughs> he looked super disappointed. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, bro. Like, we were. Well, that's all the record. We he was like, oh, I thought that was just a joke for the for the record cover. I'm like, no. Well, that's what we what we play. And he was like, oh, all right. Personally, I think after grunge, we needed something to make us feel better. Kurt Cobain was the lead singer of the group Nirvana. Their albums were bestsellers. Their songs filled with images of despair and violence. When Kurt Cobain killed himself. And no doubt was like, phew, it was right, right around the same time. I think that was more of a cultural reaction to, to a pendulum swing. It's like heavy, let's lighten it up a little bit. And it seemed like ska scene had that same angst, but with a certain amount of tongue in cheek and sarcasm and irony and like fun. Like nobody ever said you could be angry and have fun. Many people were tired of the heavy drone of grunge or the hairspray and testosterone of arena rock. Or maybe people just finally caught on to what had been happening underground for a decade. You'd hear on K-Rock, you start hearing Sublime, or you start hearing No Doubt, and you'd just go, how? What? What is, what is happening? This is confusing. The way it got on the radio was grassroots um, with the help of uh, Tazy Phillips and uh, Jed the Fish at K-Rock. Once you put those songs on the airwaves, it was magic. And it just did what these songs rarely do, which is just you know, light up the switchboard. And back then that meant a lot. I think it's, what, it's like the third most requested song in the history of K-Rock. Date Rate was not really Brad's favorite song or, or the band's favorite song. Um, so it was bittersweet. I mean, they were stoked to hear themselves on the radio, but then after that, and it was played so heavily and it brought recognition to them at these small venues that they would pack all the time now, new fans were there and they were shouting out, play date rape, play date rape. And after a while, it just, it started, that wasn't their favorite song to play. That's what you get right there, Ska. The power of Ska in the 90s, because the single for this golden cassette release was uh, date rape. That was like, oh wow, there's a song with like, you know, horn and skanking guitar. So that's crazy. Like, whoa, our, something from like our, our sound, our scene is on the radio. And then just once one band kind of started getting exposure, it brought more outside exposure in. And then Sublime was not the easiest of bands to work with. And uh, so at, at, at what point do they go, well, is there another band that we can deal with? Oh, Gwendolyn. Where's she at? Gwen Stefani from No Doubt. 
Say what's up, all right? Hi. We were this local band who had had this great, super fun, eight or nine year long run as just having so many great shows. <laughs> They, they sort of were like, the, were like the big local band for a really, really, really long time before they ever broke. And then suddenly at a rehearsal, somebody runs in and goes, did you guys see? No doubt from the cover of BAM magazine. So suddenly the, the thought and the reality that's known now, that was like the first day of it. We didn't think that anybody was gonna get huge. When No Doubt got big, we were like, wow, oh man. This is huge. This is huge for them to get big. And all of us thought, oh, well, probably just this one record, you know, or, or just this one single. We didn't expect anything like that. No Doubt became huge. And even though they weren't really playing ska music as much, you would see, oh, they have a video and the guy's wearing a Madness shirt. You know, they were still like showing uh, their roots. They were speaking to me in code. I heard the ska in there on Tragic Kingdom. I'm like, okay. You may not be saying it out loud, but you're winking at all of us ska fans. We know. We get it. Can we talk about ska for a second? There's this, is there a revival happening, or is it just a coincidence? I think it's a coincidence. What do you guys think? <laughs> I think that ska will remain underground. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know why, but uh, the people who are into the traditional ska don't really like the commercial uh, aspect, the commercial success of it for some reason. They want to hold it back. Yeah. Um, we just, we just play whatever music we feel like it. So if we throw in a ska song here there, it's all the same to us. Right. No limits sense? here. So as we were like having, you know, Don't Speak came out as a huge pop hit on all the pop stations, it would always say ska band, ska band. And I always felt like in our past we had been a ska band, but I don't think Tragic Kingdom was a ska album. But still that tag got attached to us. So I imagine there may have been a feeling uh, amongst legitimate like ska bands in the scene that we came out of. Just like, this is exciting, but no doubt it's not really a ska band anymore. So then suddenly all these elements start coming together of like, what's gonna happen? And I, I, I honestly to this day believe it put the fear of uh, success in a lot of people's heads. Ska has always been like a thing that was evolving. Like I can't think of any other genre that's been described in waves. You know what I mean? Like they call it the third wave. Obviously we're talking about traditional ska from the 60s, Desmond Decker and, you know, Toots and those guys. The two-tone bands took what the traditional bands were doing, right? And then added a little punk rock at the time, like Ramones-esque, right? Same thing, you know, we're doing the two-tone kind of music and mixing it with little no effects and descendants in there, you know? And that's what third wave is, but it's just an evolution of, you know, this, this Jamaican music. It feels kind of isolated-ish, you know? Like you're isolating people into different groups. And it's like, it's music, man. This isn't fucking sports, you know? I think ska bands are always holding their horns in their promotional photos because there's so many dudes in the photo, you want to explain kind of why that's happening. Because people see three guys, like, like, oh, that's a band. Cool. But if they see, like, 18 guys, like, they're going to be confused. Like, why is this photo in this magazine of all these dudes? So if they're holding horns, then they're, aha, uh -huh, ska band. I started in elementary school. Same. Same. Elementary school band program. <laughs> school band. Fourth grade. Right. Fourth grade. Pick an instrument. Fourth grade. And Saxophone looked cool. Yeah. Trombone looked cooler. Oh, the trumpet has a smaller case. Oh, that's... <laughs> you can actually carry it. <laughs> right, right. And when you're in school band, it, that's geeky. And like, when, when does it actually become cool? Never. You're playing jazz. You're going like, all right, cool. Like, I, I'm finally cool. I'm in the seventh grade jazz band. No, you're not cool. <laughs> all of a sudden, the band geeks had a place to be in what was a really vibrant, great indie music scene. Seeing horn sections on MTV, on videos, was a big deal for, for me and other kids my age. And then all of a sudden, it was OK in my town to have horns in your band, you know? Uh, it was actually cool. Horn player is becoming cool because the ska, I think, is is kind of the only dark side to ska because horn, <laughs> horn players are not cool 
Yeah, man, all the horn players are nerds. <laughs> they were the odd people out that never were in the punk scene or right. in the ska punk. Right. They were just like, I'm going to play in a band. Yeah. I literally only played alto sax in like concert band and jazz band before this. You know what I mean? That kind of stuff. Just hating on horn players. No. <laughs> I got love. I got you're love for horn players. players. But you know what I'm talking about. Though. I hate yeah. trumpet. When you're in high school, what other musician friends do you know? Oh, the guys in marching band. So yeah. <laughs> your natural Players. progression is, oh, we're going to be a ska band. Literally, it was like, oh, what do you play? A flute? Fuck, you could be in my ska band. Who gives a shit? Let's go, you know? <laughs> 90 ska became like, the more horns, the better. <laughs> so much horns. Just chill. You know, it's like, it's ah, driving me nuts. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then there's other times where it's like, man, I don't know, we need some horns or something, and this song's boring. We're playing a part that's just as important as a guitar part or a vocal lead or whatever. You know, it's all part of it. And it turned out great. I mean, like, seriously, like, the music just spoke for itself. I think a lot of people really got a lot out of it. It was like, they mattered. They, they like... I mattered. It was kind of crazy. Many of the ska bands in the 80s and 90s had a DIY ethic, partly because ska and punk were so intertwined and punk was built on the principle of doing it yourself. In the early 1990s, there was no internet, or at least not as we know it today. So hearing about new music or learning about a new band was largely word of mouth, or catching a band at a ska show, or reading a zine. Zines were frequently made by hand. Xerox, fold in half, stapled and mailed to lists acquired at shows. Some, like Moon Records, were also catalogs of Sky inventory. Posters and flyers to advertise the shows were also made by hand. You go to the Kinko's print place in the middle of the night and like cut and paste the flyer together or draw something and make a bunch of copies and then drive them to all the record stores. You know, making your own flyers at Kinko's, you know, you drop the the blue little like cartridge, you drop it on the floor and it would reset it, you know, so you could do it for free. See, it's just like the original drawings. So like when we were like making our first shirt, this is the front like pocket logo and the back. We just did it ourselves, like totally. We we're a really DIY band. So like our idea of like, how do you get on a record label? Well, call this record label, <laughs> you know? And it wasn't like, we're DIY, we're super cool or anything like that. It was just literally like, okay, no one else is gonna do this for us and we wanna do this. So let's call up every bar on the East Coast and see if any of them will let us play a show that night. Like that kind of thing. I, you know what, look. The ska scene was kind of different for everybody. East Coast ska and West Coast ska was totally different, you know. We tried our best to instill an East Coast versus a West Coast kind of thing. Like we wanted to start a rap battle and, and have drive-bys and stuff like that, but it never took. Can you imagine? It would just be like trombones just beating each other, like drive-by piccolos or whatever. <laughs> really wouldn't work the same way. The New York scene was just, it was popping, man. It was tons of energy. People were excited. The kids were excited. The bands were helping each other. We were playing, you know, there was a lot of back and forth with bands from Washington, from Boston. Grand Rapids didn't really have a ska scene at all. Like, no one knew. Like, the only people in Grand Rapids that knew about ska were the ones in our band. Like, if you were a ska fan, you were in Mustard Plug. That's just, it, well, if you didn't know how to play an instrument, it didn't matter, you were in Mustard Plug. We definitely stuck out like a sore thumb. This was early 90s. Everybody was trying to sound like Pearl Jam or Soundgarden or something. And, and we, here we, we'd be sandwiched between these bands. Without tooting our horn, I think that we helped kind of create a scene in Florida, you know? Well, a local scene starts with a local band. They were like, hey, we're starting a ska band and we're gonna play shows and I was like I didn't know you could just start your own band no you don't just have to like listen to music in your headphones or in your car you could actually be in a room full of people all enjoying the same music I wasn't cool I didn't know there was music scenes 
I thought like we'd be playing in the garage and then some guy in a suit would come in with a briefcase and be like, hey, you guys want a record deal? Show me all this money. Like, I don't know how it worked. The scene was a big part of it for me in Southern California was it, during the mid 90s, like the, it was so underground and most of the shows got shut down. So many venues got closed and they weren't even venues, they were just places you could have shows. Like someone would rent out a spot and just put up a PA or whatever. Thinking about going to a show by myself now, I'd be like, oh my God, scary. But back then I would just get in my car and drive to a show, know that everybody I knew was gonna be there. That's a big deal for me because I'm really awkward, so. We'd play every show no matter who it was. Came through Detroit, we'd play with them. You know, and, and some of those friendships have lasted till now. You know, Less Than Jake, Skink and Pickle, all those guys, man. We started out in St. Louis, so we were right in the center of the country. So lots of touring bands would come through and we got to be like the biggest ska band in our little area of St. Louis. In the Midwest was still about being wacky and having fun a lot. But you get to the East Coast and it seemed like there was a lot of like awesome musicians and more musicianship with the bands and the horns and everything. So they were took it all a little more seriously. So I think bands in the East Coast were a little wary of us silly West Coast bands. So the promoters were, were doing, you know, there was a big jam band scene and we started pushing the ska music on them. And it literally was always some younger guy in the uh, promoter office that was pushing the, the old school, bigger promoters. Like, we got, come on, we got to try this music. Ska is happening. And, and, and the other thing that was challenging with um, booking these bands, all of the other bands, the jam bands and stuff like that, they didn't, they didn't care about an all-age crowd. And the promoters, that's how they make their money, is by selling beer. And Skank and Pickle and some of these other bands came along and they were just like, no, it's got to be all-age. We'd book a tour and 90% of it would be, would be all-age shows and then I'd bring them some club show that was 21 and over and, and they were just like, nope, nope, not doing it. Find something else. I don't care, we'll play in somebody's garage if we have to. We've just got to be all ages. So they pushed it and pushed it and pushed it. And I think that during that time, we really changed the landscape of you know, the concert world in pushing those all-age shows. It was young people that really wanted to make fun, danceable music. You could feel that something special was happening. There was like an energy in those shows that was like palpable. Like people were going crazy and it was like a really fun, good time. Like that was the goal. Like how much fun can we have? Now you're on both sides. I mean, you have the band and you have the record label. Does that create a conflict for you? Well, I figured I find that the best way to win a, a game of tennis is to play both sides of the net. Moon Records, we sold over one and a half million records, mostly out of my basement uh, from before we had the storefront in New York in the late 90s. Moon Records were putting out a lot of records, so it gave a lot of bands a chance to be heard. I always called Moon the little engine that could because we did a lot with nothing. And um, I think a lot of people had an inflated sense of what we were and what we we're doing. But for most of the Moon Records um, career, it was just me working out of my basement. I was obsessed with mail order as a kid. I used to put cash in an envelope, which is exactly what my parents told me not to do. And then these record companies would send me albums. And if they like threw in an extra sticker, it was like the highlight of my life. It was too risky to bank on an unknown band if you were a small label, but putting out a compilation with 12 bands, each supplying their best song for the exposure of the label, it just made sense. Moon Ska, Jump Up, Asian Man, Stubborn Records, Hellcat, all released compilations of bands they represented. Ska compilation CDs were huge to the Ska community. CDs, it's a piece of plastic that you put into this thing and it spins really fast, yeah. You know, compilation was such a way to get a whole bunch of music out, you know, to a bunch of different people, to get all these different voices heard. As a band, it was, it was a fantastic way to get exposure. You would go to a town and they would come just to hear the one song that they had heard on a compilation. And these comps would call us up and we just said yes to everything. Oh, we don't even have any new songs. Well, here, take the, the crappy version of this off our demo tape. Just take it. But the thing was, it really like showed uh, you there was way more of this going on than you knew. You didn't have uh, a podcast or a radio station that was going to expose you to the new stuff, but you might have a compilation CD where 
20 out of 36 tracks felt like they changed your life. When I remember it really starting to cross over commercially, I think it was like 95. And that was um, the Rancid song, uh, Time Bomb. It's on. <laughs> it's happening. Like, this is like a mainstream radio station, and they're playing a straight up ska song. Celebrating. The label's an independent label, and somehow they crossed over into commercial radio when that was getting really difficult to do. They're a punk rock band that plays ska, but they played some of the best ska, you know? Mm -hmm. and then... I remember being stoked, just being like, holy crap, Rancid is on the fucking radio. That's nuts. Like, because I guarantee you, even those dudes probably were never like, we're going to be on the radio. You know what I mean? Or we're going to be the clash of our generation. No, I guarantee you they didn't think that. They are. You know what I mean? Ska bands, unless you sign to a big record contract, just could not sustain themselves financially. Think about it. If one venue booked four or five bands a night, did each of those bands had to split the take of the door five ways, then divide up the cash between seven or eight members each? Well, then the trombone player would be lucky to cover his own drinks. You have to be able to take care of I it mean, because money talks, and people will lie about that or skip around that. A lot of it's money, man. You know, to keep a band fed on the road when, when you're underground at all, with no radio play, no label, it takes a special kind of person, a special breed of person, a special breed of wife or girlfriend or whatever you got at home. If you had a seven piece band and this is your your sole income, it's it's just it's too hard compared to being in a three or four piece band. How is anyone gonna make money in that way? DJs are stoked. <laughs> yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. A ska band is the worst business model. Anything divided by 10 is zero. And when you're young, you never really think, oh, oh money, it's like, whatever, man, what do we make tonight? You didn't care. Uh, I remember always thinking like, man, if there were only four of us in this band, I'd be really doing well. But I would probably be the first one to go too, because I'm the horn player, so <laughs> I'm pretty thankful. There has to be some kind of passion beyond just the money. And for us, it's always been fun. It's been the fun. And now that we've been a band for 20 years, we're making more money than we've ever made as a band. But we're spending way more money on fun. We spend like hundreds and hundreds of dollars on inflatable beach balls and stupid stuff every show. How can we have more fun? How can we make it more fun for our fans? And for us, that's what keeps the Aquabats going. I'm sure that's not the answer that maybe our families or our wives want to hear. Like, wait, here's how much, what? Yeah, don't cut that out. I worked with really good bands, and so I could call a promoter and say, look, you may not make a lot of money on this show, you might even lose a few bucks, but it's going to be a really, really good band, I promise you, and, it, and I'm going to keep them coming through your market, and we'll build the crowd, and if we can build that together, then that's how this whole scene is going to grow. So I had done enough time at retail to know I never ever want to go back to that so when they kept asking for us to play shows i'm like yes i just said yes to everything and i still do you, you know we have that world's record we played 385 shows in 1996 which was the most shows ever played by a touring band our first tour we literally would get one hotel room for eight of us one hotel room eight adult men in one hotel room and i would be like Guys, can we please get two hotel rooms tonight, please? We ate peanut butter and jelly, and uh, we lived on $5 a day. Dude, That's why I ate all those McDonald's. That's when I learned that when you have the remnants of cones. seven people's yeah. Taco Bell, people go to throw out their Taco Bell. I'm like, what are you doing? Uh, I know There's that all was... that, those scraps right there, and I would take the scraps oh, man. of seven I people's that. Taco That's Bell kind of and put that all into one plate. I had forgotten. That's what I ate. That's yeah. all there was to eat. I forgot that you did that. <laughs> I lived well on that. But it was tough, man. Having a lot of people in a band sucks, and you'd like... You'd see a band like MXPX on the Warp Tour in their van, and there's just three of them. And they're like, you get your own bench? Dude, they have their own benches. Like, I have to sit next to this guy for eight hours a day, man, all fucking summer long. Fuck. Well, you're just like, oh, wow, this is great. I can actually stretch my legs just because we don't have a trombone player. So it's interesting being the only female in a band of eight guys because every guy is going to treat you different. Like, there's definitely the older brother guy that is almost waiting for someone to talk to you mean so he can get in a fight for you. There's the chivalrous ones that when there is a couch, they will give it to you. 
then there's the ones that are like gonna push you out of the way and make sure that they're just fair and you have to almost work twice as hard to prove that you're, you know, worthy of your space. Reese, our lead singer, Reese Roper, he's the only one that always tells me I look pretty and he still does it. And I think that comes from having a sister. Um, and then there's guys that are like, don't wanna know if it's that time of the month. They're just like avoiding me like the plague. So the more people you have, the more chances of somebody being like, I don't think that's a stupid idea. We should do this. No. It tends to, on the road, you tend to break down into factions, little groups of people stick together. Yeah. Like our horn players would kind of be over here if there was a fight going on. And these guys would be over here and I could kind of join whichever team I wanted to be on. That's one of the nice things about being in a band that's got so many people. We're like a, a bigger rat pack. Like, you know, who wants to go to a bookstore? I do. You know, who wants to go to the amusement park? Hey, I'll go. You don't get to just bro out with four other guys from this band. You get to bro out with 12 of them. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's three ska bands, so there's 35 of you. Yeah. Then, you know what it's, I mean? It was like... It's definitely an instant party. If you're on the road with two ska bands, you go anywhere, you, you pretty much own the place. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, like, hey. Yeah. Everyone like walks in, like everyone in the restaurant's like, what the fuck is going on? What is all this? You know, who are all these people? We were on a tour with Long Beach Dub All-Stars and Blink was also on that tour. They had some issues with their drummer and he had to go home for some something, some family thing. And Mark and Tom came to me and said, dude, before you play your set with the Aquabats, can you come learn our set or the show's not going to go on, we're not going to have a drummer. So he played our set, then he took off his costume and he was like, shh. And he killed it. And like the other guys in our band were like, oh, it's over. You know, they could tell. When I got the offer to play with Blink, I told Christian. And that was honestly the hardest, the hardest thing was leaving them. If I could have played in both bands and stayed in both bands, I would have. And I was like, there's no way. Travis, no, you won't join their band. There's no way. They have nothing in common. <laughs> I was wrong. It was emotional, man, because they really, they, they really were my, my brothers. You start off something kind of as a joke, and then pieces of your joke become worldwide sensations, and it's, it's a bit of a trip. To keep up, ska bands needs requires a lot of love. Yeah. Love towards ska music, love towards each other, love towards band. Yeah, we need love. I automatically assume that we didn't have a lot of love from the punk scene because we were just too happy. <laughs> it was oil and water. You couldn't blend these two to save your life, let alone the people in the crowd. But after all these people started seeing a bigger picture and started finding ways to connect the two, they now do. Most people, when they first heard the music, I heard it out loud. That's not ska! That's not ska! Okay. The purists, you know, the traditionalists, they were like, okay, if it doesn't sound like two-tone or if it doesn't sound like the ska lights, you know, we don't want anything to do with it. Yeah, they weren't as into some of this kind of pseudo-punky ska combo, which is what we were. And when you're a kid, you know, you're not going to wait until you know every single thing about this genre of music. Just, let's just do it! Woo! Just, okay, they're horns, okay, and you just do, okay, woo! We're making ska music. That's not ska music. Yeah, it is. No. No? No. We didn't really notice it until we started heading out on the road and doing little jaunts and like get to San Francisco where you've got some real like two tone kids who were just like, the fuck are you doing? What is this fucking shit? You know, and there's a glam rock element in Real Big Fish, too, that people were not, you know, like, necessarily on board with right away. Yeah, there was definitely some elitist stuff going on. People that only wanted to listen to two-tone and, and no heavy guitars, just upstroke stuff. And then you uh, you had the ska punk purist. Well, is this band ska punk or is this band punk? And that stuff was going on. And, and I don't know, I, I tried to, to do this to a lot of it because I didn't feel that you know, by playing with any band, we were hurting anybody or anything. If you, did, if you didn't like it, you didn't like it, you know. Sometimes a crowd could turn. One minute, everyone would be singing along and unity was skanking to the horns. The next minute, there'd be a fight breaking out. It was usually someone who had too much to drink. Or worse, a racist who somehow found a way into a ska show. Ska stood for racial unity. 
black and white together, side by side. Fans did not stand for it. Nazi skins had no place in ska. There was this time where there was a, all these like guys who would come to shows with like shaved heads. They just run in circles and punch everybody. I don't know what that was about. That was a bummer. We played some dangerous shows in the 90s where uh, you know, skinheads would show up and police and riot gear would come. You know, we used to stop mid-song when there was a fight and say, we're not gonna play anymore until you guys stop it or take it outside. I don't know why that's a thing, going to ska shows and fighting, but I've seen more fights at Hepcat shows than I've seen at any death metal show or whatever weird show I've been to. In 1995, the Mighty Mighty Bostones played during a club scene in the blockbuster hit Clueless. Dickie Barrett Snarl, Ben Carr Skank, and the world was introduced to this brand of ska, Boston ska core. The next big thing was finally here, and the audiences liked what they heard. A quirky, fun, fast music that was described as punk with horns. The impact of the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones appearance on Clueless helped to bring attention to all ska bands. Like they say, a rising tide lifts all boats. We didn't want to be portrayed as like a fad or something. Back to the Beach had just come out. And like Fishbone, who's one of our favorite bands, like looking back on it now, it was kind of cool. But at the time, it was kind of a drag. <laughs> like seeing them dancing around with Annette Funicello. Do you girls know how to Jamaica ska? Jamaica what? But I think to the young boss tones, we thought it was pretty lame. But the fact that Amy Heckerling was making it, who had done Fast Times at Ridgemont High, like I think that made us feel a lot more comfortable. And also we had gotten into some tax trouble. So we were like, yeah, we can do this movie. We can pay off our taxes. Because for us, it was a lot of money. And it ended up being pretty awesome, like cool and fun. And I mean, some of the guys in the band still get royalties from that movie, so. When you say ska, either people say one, you know, one of three things. They'll say, ska, what, what's that? What did you say? Ask you to repeat it. They'll say ska and they'll laugh because they think it's like this novelty that fizzled out in the 90s. Or they'll say ska and they'll get it. And they'll know it and they'll love it, just like you do, and then those are your people. Anybody, anybody know anything about ska music? Anybody know how to pick it up? Any? Yeah, kind of. From like growing up. Okay, uh, what ska bands come to mind? Um, what, they sing this like famous song, Impression That I Get. Okay, what bands come to mind when you think ska music? Mighty Mighty Boss Tones, Real Big Fish. I mean, Real Big Fish. Everyone knows Real Big Fish. We can go for that. Uh, do you know any Real Big Fish songs? Uh, yeah. Could you sing one for us? Will you sing one with me? Sure. Call me late last night to say hey, she loved, loved me so. so. Didn't da -da 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 matter anymore. anymore. Said da -da she never cared and that she never da -da -da will. will. Do it I all again. Oh, that's the second I verse. Da -da 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 -da. Do you have a familiarity with ska music? Yes, I do. Back in the 90s, I uh, came down to a number of ska shows all over the village, like Scottalites, uh, Mephiscopheles, oh man, the Slackers. How about you guys? Oh yeah, I was in a band called Real Big Fish. Uh, I was in the band for 17 years and don't remember the words, so. Hello, <laughs> what's up? Because there was a big resurgence of ska in the 90s where it was on the... But I did a lot of drugs, so I don't remember a lot of that. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. I already forgot your name. Scott and Michaela, yes? Scott, Michaela, Real Big Fish, not Real Big Fish. I go 100 miles a year. You're crazy, I wouldn't drive that. We drove 100 miles to play! <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Hey, we don't mind. Are you sorry? Okay, but, um, you had a request? We got lucky. We were in the right place at the right time. Holy shit. <laughs> that was the first band ever that I just, like, insisted that I needed to help try and get them signed, right? So I brought them to Mojo Records. I used to work at Subway. Sandwich place. And then one of those nights, we played one of those really big shows. And just this huge crowd was singing along to my songs. And I had to work at Subway, and I'd be there like 8 the next morning. And I got up and like, no way. I'm rock star now. So I quit Subway the next day. And then I was really broke for like a year. 
<laughs> but then it worked out. Yay! Let's go bowling, real big fish, daddies. We all crammed into a hotel room waiting for real big fish's video to come on. It played. We all yeah, we got drunk and the whole thing. That was exciting. That was like in the movies where everybody's like, yeah, you're on TV. We're all dancing around. Then, like almost immediately, it was just <laughs> just the this like huge, you know. They they just had this this funness about them. It was infectious. And roll camera to go. B. And action. Yeah. Yeah. Oh hi. My name is Monique. I'm in a band called Say Ferris. So I came into the ska world mostly because I grew up in the center, like we kind of call it ground zero for the third wave of ska, which was in Orange County in Southern California. This is distracting. <laughs> but I wasn't a scene kid until probably my freshman year of college because I was studying opera. <laughs> I knew this is where I need to be. And uh, I'm in the right place at the right time and I better take advantage of this. Back then there was no internet or cell phones like it is now. So you kind of just once in a while you talk to somebody at home and they would say, you guys are getting played on the radio like every 20 minutes. And we would just be like, cool, I'm in Oklahoma, you know, <laughs> at, a, at a burger joint, you know, yeah. whatever. Like we were just kind of disconnected from what was really happening at home. Like for me as a woman, like seeing like No Doubt and Say Ferris, like that was really cool. Like felt like women were invited to the party, you know? And your audience was 50% girls. So it didn't ever feel like you were the lone girl in the room. Me and Elise are, um, you know, we have our whole little act together on stage. Like, a, we're just, like the whole band sort of comes alive, you know, on stage. I don't wanna go out. Love dancehall crashers. Oh my God. They were like everything. Being a woman in the scene, you get the door people and the sound guys that, that think you're like the backup dancer or the, you know, the groupie and you can't, I mean, there's been times I haven't been able to get into a club that I'm headlining at because they just don't believe me. And especially if I'm dressed up, ready to go on stage and I'm coming from outside, they just, they just don't believe you and they just think that you're a groupie and you're like, no, I'm actually got to be on stage in five minutes and if you don't let me in, the show's not going to go on and you're going to be fucked. There weren't a lot of women in bands at that time, in ska bands or in the scene. And it really, I looked different from everybody else. Like I'm a size 12, I wear sexy dresses, I tell an entire audience of men to fuck off, <laughs> you know, and you're just gonna have to fall in love with me, I'm sorry. I know I'm different, but like, here I am. I had a little bit more meat on my bones and I had to sell it. All I wanted to do was sing. So selling myself was a means to be able to get on stage and sing. And I also felt a responsibility to the girls in the audience who were, felt different like me. But inside I was so sensitive and, and I look back on those videos, I'm like, you look good, little Mo. <laughs> you look so pretty. And now the curtain has gone up on another unique attraction, ska music. The scene was taking off so rapidly. And then ska exploded. We all got famous. And then people started getting signed. You know, Real Big Fish got signed to a big label, and say Ferris did. And I mean, labels kind of go after a certain sound that's really happening. So a lot of major labels signed ska bands at the time couldn't believe it, you know, it was on an answer machine. I remember coming home, I was delivering pizzas at the time. I was like, yeah, I'm an ANR up in Capitol. I'm like, okay, who's who's pulling our leg here? This, is, this isn't this is real. And um, that guy followed us around for eight months trying to sign the band. 
you know, around this time, Suicide Machines got signed, Goldfinger got signed. So to us, because it was such a, th a stigma in the 90s of, oh, you can't be on this label, you can't sell out. So to us, we had to be on Fat Records or Epitaph, and we had rejection letters from both of those labels. You know, so we were like, so they don't want us, but this label does. What's this guy hearing that they, they don't hear, you know? We started playing to a larger audience and there was less skanking in the audience, <laughs> but the love was still there. And it was nice because we were able to spread the love to other people that weren't just like in the ska, and we introduced them maybe to something new. We're clever like and energetic. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can keep up with them. Oh, that's good music though. Toe nice. tapping. Ska was starting to get radio airplay. Radio executives called it fresh and different. Ska was now heard in Akron, Ohio, Jackson, Wyoming, and Wheeling, West Virginia. How you doing? Carson Daly, MTV Ska Today. I am your tour guide to the music known as Ska. Ska is a type of music that has its origins in Jamaica. The music enjoyed its biggest popularity in the 80s with bands like The Specials, The English Beat, and Madness. Yet a handful of Ska-influenced bands are flourishing on today's pop charts. The song Sell Out by Real Big Fish was all over the radio, poking fun of themselves from making money off the once underground DIY distribute from your basement genre. Sell out with me, oh yeah, sell out with me tonight. The record companies only give me lots of money and everything's gonna be alright. What's funny about a song called Sell Out being a big hit on the radio and MTV? A record label had a good sense of humor. And then just, it became weird because I'd be driving in the car, listening to the radio, Sell Out would come on, be flipping through the TV channels, Sell Out would be on MTV. If you think I'm awkward now, imagine seeing that. Weird. But yeah, that was crazy. That was like in the movies, where there's the montage of like, they're playing a small show, and then they get bigger and bigger, and then you should, they pan up the charts, oh, going to number one. Ticket sales and like it was just like money in the background falling and you know in the movies it was like that. Who are you here to see? Mighty Mighty Boss Tones. Yeah. 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 The Mighty Mighty Boss Tones finally had a gigantic hit. Everybody, we're back. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's face it is the new album from my next guest. Please give a nice welcome to the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones. <laughs> Like, whoa, the Boss Tones are on the radio. This is awesome. Is the radio starting to become awesome? Or is it just the Boss Tones are so awesome that they couldn't say no anymore, you know? I think it might have been a little of both. I don't know. <laughs> they had been an underground success for a long period of time and had put out lots of records that, that a lot of people that I knew liked but then they really broke wide and had the MTV airplay, and it's just a whole different level. And every time impression that I get would come on, I'd be like, oh, now that's a good song. They deserve this. And then Sellout would come on, oh my God, my band sucks. For us, it was just like such a steady climb. There was, even when we had the hit on the radio, like I, th I think we felt like, like what took so long. There was never really a moment where we were like an overnight success. Maybe to a lot of people we were because of the hit song and you know radio and being number one on MTV for a whole summer. During that time when it was just started starting to hit, that's when you really started realizing it was like, whoa, shit, this is so much excitement. Yeah. So many people coming to shows who's never really, oh, I never heard of this type of music before. You know, shows went from like like a hundred people to all of a sudden it was like three, four hundred people. And then it's like, it wasn't just like the weird people who liked music in school. It, you know, it was like everybody was in school, the cheerleaders and the, the jocks, like everybody's coming to these shows. This is crazy. I mean, you would arrive at the shows and people are there. I mean, they're really happy to see you. We were selling 100 CDs a night. These, it was crazy, it was crazy, it was mayhem. Every, everything ska was moving off the shelf. I don't know how many records we sold, I don't care, don't know. I'm sure I should have a, uh, a gold record. I should be doing cocaine on my bathroom in my, you know, on. But who knows how many records they've sold? I don't. I don't know. Yeah, so we got really famous. Uh, you've heard of it, Real Big Fish. 
This is what is called a gold record. In the old days, people used to pay money for music. And if the, enough people paid money for your music, you would get one of these to commemorate like half a million, a million, 10 million. This is the lowest amount you can sell to get like a, a thing. You got exposed to a lot of people that didn't hear your music on this TV show or that movie or this video game. You had kids getting introduced to Ska by playing Tony Hawk video games, you know? The video game came out, they gave us a copy. I played it in the back of the bus on tour every day, all day. There was literally times where our tour manager had to say, Darren, you're on stage in half an hour. I'm like, yeah, cool. Darren, you're on stage in 15 minutes. Yeah, 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 cool. Darren, you're on stage right now. I'm like, fuck. And I'd pause the game, put it down. And the whole time I'm playing, I'm thinking, I gotta get back to that game. And still to this day, I get people coming up to me and saying, because of that video game, Goldfinger and Superman introduced me to Ska. Thank you. I didn't know these bands existed. No one at the time would really think a video game would be that big of a marketing tool for a band. And Tony Hawk picked the song, decided to put it in there, and it changed the full trajectory for our band. So thank you, Tony Hawk. You're welcome. You get mileage out of the weirdest things that you did. You know, there's people now that have come to the shows because they realized that the band in the Good Burger movie is us. Welcome to Good Burger, home of the Good Burger. Can I take your order? Why is their band blowing up and not us? It must be something the label is doing. Say, no, man, you don't understand the dynamic. They're in the right place at the right time. Uh, so some bands got lucky and uh, zoomed up to the next stratosphere through whatever combination of events, and some bands that should have done didn't, but that's just the nature of the beast. There were a lot of bands on the radio that were ska, but not that many. So the ones that didn't make it, there's a lot of like sour grapes and bad jealousy and like, oh, screw them, they're sellouts, they didn't make it, stuff. And I think with the fans too, you have your precious scene of your friends that you go to these, all these shows and they're your bands and then suddenly every asshole at school that you hate is listening to them too. And I know, I get it. I know how it feels to be on both sides, so. Everybody suddenly had these splitting ideas. Some thought like, oh, well, no doubt did it, we should get it. Others wanted to kind of back away from the spotlight. Listening to like, you know, No Doubt or the Boss Tones, it's like radio pop rock, you know? It's like we were just, yes, they, were, they fall under the umbrella of ska, but they're just two different things. If anything, I thought what's good for the goose is good for the gander. People will hear the word ska, they'll be more open to it. So I thought it was good overall, but it was also like, you're doing something completely different. Like we're riding a, a moped and you're driving a Cadillac. Checkers equals ska. And race cars too. It was like unity and like races uniting black and white together. And so that's why the black and white checkers kind of became a, a thing of ska, a symbol. Actually, that wasn't so overt as to say, here's a symbol of racial unity. It was some tape that Jerry Dammers had on his scooter, but still today we can embrace the symbolism. You know, ska for me has always been a thing that no matter what the subject matter in the song is, it's a very uplifting experience, you know what I mean? You can sit there and say it's happy, fun music, but to be honest with you, it was a really important socially how it started. And then we fucked it up here in America. There's a philosophy that comes with ska, well, at least with two-tone, and that was the unification of mankind. Black folks, white folks, and, you know, all hues in between um, came together around an idea, and an, an idea that had a, a, a definite political root. Political overtones of ska were lost in the 90s. Especially the ska that we're talking about, that we morphed it into, you're talking about suburban kids being goofy, having a release, completely different. It made it just like, oh, this silly party music. But historically, ska was very political. 
it's the the most important part to me of the music. I think in the 90s it wasn't as clear of a message as I would like it to have been, but there was still Mike Park was doing was doing it very well and there and Boss Tones were and there were definitely people that were promoting that as a big part of their message. Unity, togetherness, getting each other's back, inclusiveness, racial harmony, like these were big things. So in 1998, I put together the Ska Against Racism tour and that was in direct response to my feeling that Ska was being looked at as this corny sound or music or movement. I was like, let's put some politics back into Ska. More than anything, we just wanted the word against racism on a marquee and just people talking about it. A very famous uh, singer one time said, I can't change the world, but I can change the world around me. And what that means is each one of you guys up front and all the way in the back and everyone over here, we gotta start being non-hatred against other people, okay? Ska equates to unity to me. That's what I loved about it, because you had black, white, Mexican, Asian, and we were all in one room and we were all there for one reason, and that was the skank. Nobody was against anyone for that moment in time. Even to this day, you see that in the scene where everyone's just coming together, no, no matter what race, color, or creed. And I think, man, I'll tell you, music needs more of that. Music needs more of that. This world needs more of that. Many ska bands never signed big contracts. They did, however, enjoy some pretty decent rotation from college radio or independent stations. And shows, well, those were always a sellout in a good way. Hepcat, Buck 09, The Pie Tasters, The Suicide Machines, The Toasters, The Slackers, Brutogoskos, all headline cross-country shows that were filled to capacity. American ska in the 1990s was a million miles from its Jamaican roots. But it still sounded good and it still brought many fans to explore the origins. Ska in all forms experienced popularity. Some for the first time, some for the first time in 40 years. Ska made itself a trend. And while some people had long hoped for that one Ska song to break and pave the way for others, some said it would be the nail in the coffin, or better yet, a time bomb. I mean, the oversaturation of Ska Punk happened. You know, we watched it happen. We watched it just go zoop. And then everybody with a horn decides to form a band. And then people are like, what is this? And he went from having 20 bands to having a thousand bands. I mean, that's the way I saw it happen. We'd play like with like bands that popped up like a week ago. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Almost like too many shows or too many bands. I mean, I do think some of that started happening. Like we play these small towns, especially like in the Midwest. And there would be, every night on tour was like a ska festival. Like, where there'd be six or seven local ska bands opening up. And you just suffer through it. Everyone's, really like it. everyone's playing so fast and high yeah. energy that you kind of wear out the audience before yeah. the headliner even comes on. And there were some bands that were bloody awful. <laughs> and marching bands, like brass players that couldn't play too well. But it's, they'd put like six ska bands on the night, you know. And you're going like... Uh, no, sometimes I, I get scarred out, you know. I think I, I swing back to my hotel room and listen to some Johnny Cash. <laughs> uh, and that's fine, because like, there's a lot of bad music in every genre, but for some reason, people really zeroed in on the bad ska music when it was happening, you know? Major labels were, in some ways, making ska almost a parody of itself. Anytime you do that, it just destroys it. So that underground base was gone. People were like, I don't want to be part of this anymore. By the time the new millennium approached, Ska was already on its way out. The Ska bubble had burst. Oh boy, what happened? If we only knew, we could make a documentary about it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I think that's... It just got... I don't know. Like It really like got dorky. They made it look like a flash in the paint, like, Scott, man, we're wacky, and then done. The way it exploded is the way it died. It was like one day it was all there, then it was gone. And shows went from being thousands to, you know, back to being hundreds. All of a sudden, new metal was cool. It was like Deftone, Flint Biscuit, and Scott is not cool. Like, 99, it was like, bam, psh, nobody went to Scott shows. <laughs> this is terrible, because <laughs> here's the pendulum swing. You know, it's like, and then, wee, and now it's back to, you know, 
in a different way. What, it, what typically happens when something gets really popular is the record companies come in and they pick a couple of the bands and those are the bands that get all the glory. They were selling the humor, the fun, the party, to have a good time. And that's how they sold Scar. They didn't show it as they would have put a rock band. Come on, when they market a rock band, a rock band like U2 or anything like these dudes have great lyrics, you know, great sounds. I mean, and then you'll have someone else that could be funny. You could have that. You could have everything. But they only showed one side of Scar, which was, was a letdown. Some of that stuff was a little disappointing to me because it was kind of like, oh, this is like a frat party gone, you know, gone wild or whatever. And it's like, no, it's not. That's not, no, it's not frat party, okay? This is fucking ska show. This ain't none of that. The approach to ska music in the 90s was like that game you play at parties where you tie a blindfold on somebody and you give them a pin and they've got to pin the tail on the donkey. Where do you think ska music is on the donkey? And where these record execs was pinning the ska tail was nowhere in the correct place. So we had all these like pretty lame pop bands being labeled as ska music when, when they weren't at all. all around the world, and then it sort of got blurry. Like there were bands that you didn't really know if they were ska or what they were. They were just a big band with horns. And then there was a brief 10 seconds of swing. And then it became emo or what, it was just like, the music industry was just um, geared towards churning out these new trends every few years. A few years later, you know, people aren't buying ska music like that. And not only that, people aren't buying music. Oh, Napster. Oh, people are stealing music. Oh, no one's gonna buy your records anymore. You're gonna have to tour a lot if you wanna keep doing this. And it was a bittersweet moment, but I think realistically the concept was adapt or die. Hello, friends! It's silly, and sexy sells, but silly can also sell if you package it right. So my thought was, if we could get a TV show and do a kid's show, we could still play music, we could still tour, we could still do basically essentially what we're doing, but we just have to make a TV show during the day. I was watching TV with my daughter and still thinking about doing an Aquabats show, but thought, what if we just did something a little younger, something for my family, like, packaging cool music and good art and visuals and stuff we like, but into something for younger kids. And that's where Yo Gabba Gabba came out of. After it peaked and it went back down, once again, we're like, okay, we're the weirdos that play ska again, you know? So it felt like putting on like comfy pair of shoes when it got not popular again for us. I mean, I think at one point there's definitely a backlash, you know, against the, against the movement. And if you were in a ska band, you had to be a little tough because everyone thought you were the weak kid on the block. So, you know, we would go to these places where hardcore bands are playing or screamo or emo or whatever genre is flowing through. And you have to stand up there and be like, I'm in a ska band and I'm going to play. The great thing about ska is that like punk rock, there's always going to be a subculture and a scene for what we do. But a lot of bands at the time we're putting out their second record or whatever, and kind of brushing the horns aside, dropping them all together, saying, "Oh no, we're rock with horns," or "No, we're 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 a rock band." We're you know whatever. There were a lot of ska bands that would kind of reconfigure things and become an emo band or whatever. It was a really strange time. I don't know that I can fault somebody for that if they were like played in a band called Skinkalicious Till You Drop and then the <laughs> next year decided they weren't into that anymore. There was a time where there was no choice. You had to turn your back on ska because the superficial construct of ska was so commercialized and overblown. Every Food Network song was a ska, real big fish copy. Every sure. Target commercial was like a bouncy, another real big fish copy and so when it becomes like the i guess just mainstream sell bullshit with no consciousness of a subgenre that people felt real ownership of i don't blame anybody at that time for turning their back to it because you weren't playing sky anymore you were playing food network music you know what's crazy? i'm gonna tell you what's crazy dude america creates all this good music right then they forget about it 
Then the surrounding countries pick it up in its rawest, most richest form and keep it. Es realmente es muy popular el ska en México. Yo me atrevo a decir que México es la la capital del ska ahorita mundialmente es donde tenemos los festivales más grandes. Es donde las bandas de todo el mundo pueden venir. Se cae ni a ma. Honto ni ska ski na hito ga ito. Kanarazu ite ma. Keshite majority de anai desu kido. Ano de sore sore ironna type no ska ga atte. Ah, kore de inja mi tae na. I never would have thought my music like they listen to it in. You know, in Venezuela, or they listen to it like, how did they, you know, how did they get it? And that, I would say, is a benefit of the technology and just the internationality of the music. Other countries, I felt a lot of times kind of appreciated the music a little bit more. I think they appreciated like horns being in music, you know. Pero pues como como un género de música popular eh, se ha incorporado de una manera pues muy fácil, digamos, a la música mexicana. Y con sonidos ya muy locales, ¿no? La, la sección de alientos de las bandas mexicanas luego retoman mucho o suenan mucho como a, a, a la música de mariachi. El, el ritmo, el nombre del ritmo en sí, ya se le reconoce. Antes quizás eh, a, a otras bandas les decían rock en tu idioma o, o, o alternativo, no sé. I never dreamt we, we would go any further than getting on to like some decent opening slots in Orange County, you know, much less uh, getting to go like we went to Tasmania. You, you ever heard of someone who went to Tasmania? I went to Tasmania. Our first time in Japan, this crowd is sitting on the floor. Right, all just kind of sitting on the floor, Indian style, before the show, and and I was thinking to myself, I'm like, oh, this is gonna fucking suck. Like they sit down at shows here, show time comes, and we we walk up on stage, and the whole thing, boom, everybody jumps to their feet, just right up to the barricade of the stage, right, and are just like into it, dude, fucking from the beginning. Then I go to start to sing the first line. And they all know the words, like every word. And I was just, I was so floored that luckily they were singing because I got fucking choked up. I was like, oh, it was the most amazing feeling I've ever had. Because you're halfway around the world, people are just fucking losing their minds. I mean, from that point, it was just like, man, we're never gonna stop doing this. This is so awesome that that was it. It was. The sound that was so big that, of course, it was the sound that was out of fashion as soon as it crashed, and it's kind of the sound that needed to vanish for a while for people to appreciate that it's been gone, you know. And it's funny that in the time period that it kind of vanished, in many ways, in the Anglo-American scene, you saw the Latin American scene run with it in a way that I could have never imagined. In 2007 was when we had our first festival in LA. And we had close to 3,000 kids. It's this whole generation that grew up loving ska music and and especially bands like Voodoo Glow Skulls. I mean, it's so big sometimes. A lot of the kids are even too young. Where they're like, who are these old dudes? People that are 16 years old that might not know. It's like, you know, why are my dads up on stage? Some of these bands only sing in English, and and they hardly know English. But they're singing in English, you know, because the ska punk in the states has influenced them in that way. A la gente le le gustaba mucho que poder cantar las letras, ¿no? Las canciones. Y cuando una vez que que llega a Toasters, como que descubren un nuevo panorama de de, de ska actual, este, que bueno, que me encanta en español. This underground ska scene in the Latino community is is just amazing. You see the mosh pits out there, and it's a lot of kids, and they're like dressed up. It makes me feel like this music has not died. It's not going anywhere. Let's go interview some of the kids, the youth of today. When you're young and you start a band, you don't really think like, "Hey, where is this road taking me? How long am I going to be in this band?" Right? And then 20 years later, you think, "Wow, man, this has affected my whole life. I've pretty much painted myself into a corner. Like, what am I doing?" You, you know. You keep playing in the band because that's all you have, or do you get a job working at the taco shop? Who knows? But when you start a band, you don't think about those things. You're just doing it for some reason, 
And if it's for the money or it's for to meet chicks or for the fame, that stuff, it, it's always fleeting. But if it's for something deeper, like you really love having fun or making people happy or you really love the music, I think that's what keeps people doing things that they do. And that's why we keep doing the Aquabats. We love it. We love playing music. We love making people happy, making kids dance, and knowing that, you know, we're spoiling it for all the other bands. You know, kids are coming to see us play. Oh, my first band was the Aquabats, and they did this, and then this monster came out, and then this, these balloons, and then, then I went and saw that other band, and they're just, they just played their songs. When they dropped off, you know, everybody said, oh, this is the end, but the Slackers kept playing, and Pie Tasters kept playing, and the Toasters kept playing, and Fishbone kept playing, and, you know, and then there were younger bands that were coming up and playing and carrying the torch, and uh, there's some of the best ska bands I've ever heard that are playing right now. It's always going to be there, like craze or no craze, but the craze was good. <laughs> it was a good time. You know, when you, when you go to a ska show, you're like, wow, I want all of this. This is amazing. And when you're a kid who doesn't know anything and you don't have any judgments, I get misty-eyed thinking about it because you're 14, 15 years old and you're and it's a place of acceptance. So I, I guarantee you there's kids that go to ska shows today and are like, I want all of this. I want all of this, just like I do. So. I think you do an interview and one of the standard questions is, what's your secret? How do you do it? How are you still doing so well? How do you keep those crowds coming to the shows? It's like, what? Well, try to play the songs they like. What's wrong with that? We want to be an active band and continue making songs and it's fun. But, you know, we also know that we have this catalog behind us that if, we wouldn't have to record another song ever. We have enough songs that people have memories attached to that we, we could go play. So it's a good position to be in, you know. I say nostalgia referring to myself all the time because bring it on. <laughs> to me, it's an awesome word, but some people may be like, oh, I don't want to, I want to be a current band. Well, good luck. I mean, being real big fish now, kind of, I mean, there's the ska thing that happened in the 90s, but there's also, now it's like a nostalgia for 90s music. So since we were on the radio and stuff in the 90s, there's people that like, oh, I love 90s music. I love Britney Spears and Limp Bizkit and Sugar Ray and Real Big Fish and Nirvana and Right Said Fred and Backstreet Boys and Hanson and Marilyn Manson and 90s music, you know? I think right now, because the pull of the 90s explosion is so, that, that tide is pulled back so far that young listeners like 16 and 17 don't really even know what it was. It's in the history books. So um, when ska hits again this next time, it, for them it's going to be the first time. A new band could come out right now and it, they wouldn't be like, ew, you're a ska band. It's like, oh cool, what kind of music is this? I've never, it's, can you tell me about it? You guys are awesome. Ska is more popular than ever in countries like Mexico, Japan, and all over Europe. And in America, Ska still has a fiercely loyal following. Now, more than ever, the world would be a better place with just a little more Ska. Ska has been around for so long, and it's still like something new. You know, everybody's excited about it. Every day somebody comes along and someone will come along with a new beat or a new sound, creating something new. So it's good to know that uh, this guy lives on. If you would have asked me about three years ago what the future of ska was, I would say the future of ska is all of us getting out our old CDs and showing our kids and dancing in the living room about the good old days. That's what I would have thought because I thought those days were over. But I think it has moved past, you know, TJ Maxx commercials and being played in department stores. And I think that people are gonna start picking up horns again. It's like so much darkness in the world and so many problems. And we need a place to be able to go and feel like I felt when I was 17, going to Real Big Fish shows and just like being okay. Like you felt like everything was gonna be okay in the world. God never went away. It never went away. It just it just uh, dips in and out of the mainstream. Yeah. For us, who we, we started a ska band in 2011. And if we're going to 
make music, why can't it be something that is something that feels like home? It's never been about trying to get on the radio or, or, or anything. It's just about what feels right to us. Yeah. And that circles back to having a, a place to go, something yep. you can listen to that makes you feel less alone. Yep. For me, the whole thing was about finding community and a place to belong. Living in Southern California, you don't realize how fortunate you are to have as much at your disposal when you go to small little towns and you play some crazy little community center that holds, you know, 25 kids and they're in this little small town and nobody brings these disenfranchised youth anything because they're the weird kid in town, you know? And just the, the, to see them come and dance and feel uninhibited, I don't know, that's, that's beautiful. Because that was the real like takeaway from the entire ska music experience for me is it's like, I got to make a difference. Fuck money, fuck fame, make a difference. Like none of that shit fucking matters if, if it doesn't, like, connect to something human. The end. <laughs> Credits roll. Billy built a robot in his parents' garage Because he had a list of problems that he needed to solve He said, I'm sick of the hills Laguna Beach is fake and whack Let's party like it's 96 and bring the horn section back Back before when Stefani started rapping with Pharrell Gas cost 115 and Goldfinger could sell When reality TV wasn't scripted or contrived The brass was fat and bumping and the beats were all played live See, Billy was obsessed with third wave ska The mighty boss throws real big fish Less than Jake, he's seen them all He's long for a time when even Bill Clinton played the sax On the White House lawn and kids wore shades from checker slacks So Blizz is back in the class and laughs With no one on his lap and he plans his task To make a giant robot, how's that? Bring the real Orange County back White shoes, black hat, said to attack the robot Headed to the hills to give those spoiled kids a smack Chris kept Larry, got my flat As Billy bumped the aquabats He ripped out Misha Barton's spines He cranked safe Ferris and Sublime He burned down Heidi Montag's home And he blast the OC super tones He screamed while smashing Elsie's head Stop, it's not dead This gigantic robot kills He's gonna come down the block He's gonna fire at will He's got his bullets from his elbows Shooting missiles from his eyes He's gonna win You do the Macarena as you rock your Tamagotchi with your Newton down at Woodstock playing Sega Lottie Dottie. He brought the 90s back and then he freed Tibet. If you can't find this gym on Napster, then the warehouse sells cassettes. Oh, gigantic, he was gigantic, this robot. Gigantic, so very gigantic. This guy robot. This gigantic robot kills. He's gonna come down the block. He's gonna fire at will. He's gonna get it on his shoulder. Yeah.